Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NAGT webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Teaching Landslide Analysis to Undergraduates, Planning for Failure and a Safer Society, and is sponsored by Getsy. Please take a minute to review the Zoom controls on the screen. We ask that you leave your microphones muted and video cameras off. If you have questions and comments along the way, we encourage you to enter those into the chat box. To access that chat box, find the Zoom control bar and click on the chat button. Uh, webinar presenters and staff will be monitoring, monitoring the chat for your questions and comments. The NAGT webinar series is your one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Webinars in the series feature novel and innovative work in earth education research and pedagogy, new teaching materials, and the classroom and professional experiences of people like you. The NAGT webinar series is free and open to the public, and we encourage you to invite your colleagues to attend and join the discussion. On screen is a link to the webinar series where you can find the webinar schedule, an archive of past events, and information on our sponsoring projects and programs. You can also find slides, resources, and recordings of each webinar, including today's, through the webinar archives. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Beth, who will uh, introduce today's topic and a little bit about Getsy. Okay, thanks, Mitchell. Um, so my name is Beth Pratsitola, and I'm the project manager for the Getsy project, which is Geodesy Tools for Societal Issues. Um, if you want to follow along um, on the module itself, you can go to the circ.carlton.edu slash Getsy or um, 234626. <laughs> um, and um, if you go to the main page there, it's um, in the majors level section, which is slightly down. Uh, I'll be giving a brief introduction to Getsy and Geodesy, and then I'll be handing it over to Bobby Karimi, who uh, was one of the authors of the Planning for Failure module. So just to give you a little bit of uh, um, an idea behind the Getsy project and the uh, larger sister project, Integrate, and how we situate it and why we situate it within societal issues, um, if we think about challenges facing us now, um, there are an awful lot of societal challenges that um, involve STEM and, you know, and uh, within that geoscience be it climate change, uh, natural hazards, water resources. And at the same time, we're also um, facing the, the need to engage students better in STEM for literacy and for future workforce. And it actually turns out that there's a complementary path to improvement on this, um, in that if you situate the STEM learning within um, uh, a societal context, uh, not only do students learn better, but they're actually more likely to consider STEM as a field. The Getsy project specifically has the mission to develop, disseminate, uh, de develop and disseminate teaching and learning materials that feature in particular geodesy data and quantitative skills applied to these critical societal issues that geodesy can do, which is climate change, water resources, and natural hazards. It is um, a sister project, a little sister project, you could say, to integrate. Um, it's been funded over four grants now, um, developing 13 modules of something like two weeks each, introductory majors level, classroom field, and this particular module is a classroom majors level module. Uh, to make sure we're on the same page about what I mean by geodesy, it is the science of accurately measuring the Earth's size, shape, orientation, the mass distribution, and, and, and especially how these um, vary with time. Traditionally, I mean, you might have thought of a geodesy as just surveying precise positioning of points on the earth. Um, whereas uh, now we really, in the last few decades, have this toolbox of techniques to better measure the earth. And if you decide to unpack this toolbox, it includes things like um, high precision global positioning, interferometric synthetic aperture radar in SAR, which is good for regional deformation. Um, high resolution topography is also considered part of geodesy and that's really what um, what the data source is for this module that you'll be hearing about today which is um, mostly lidar uh, airborne lidar laser detecting later light detecting and ranging and also structure from motion can provide these high resolution um, models strain meters tilt meters creep meters gravity measurements and sea level and ice altimetry are also all part of this toolbox to behind each of these modules um, uh, are five guiding principles. So they need to address one or more geodesy related grand challenge, make use of authentic and credible scientific geodetic data, improve students' understanding of the nature and methods of science, um, that like how science is conducted and communicated, 
And there needs to be a deeper level of involvement with interdisciplinary problem. I think of this in um, terms of applying geoscience learning to societal issues, be it um, policy or economics, but something more than just like landslides, they can knock down houses, you know, and then onto the data. It needs to be more deep and authentic than that. And um, uh, because of the geophysics emphasis in Getsy, um, we decided to emphasize quantitative skills as our fifth guiding principle. All of the materials were developed following a backwards design um, in that we started with the learning goals and moved on to more granular um, learning outcomes. Then you need to think about, well, how would I know if these goals and outcomes are accomplished? So you determine your assessment strategy and then design the teaching materials and the instructional um, plan to match. All the materials were uh, piloted by the author and a non-author, by both authors and a non-author, revised um, and, um, and, and then published. So this is the, the integrate model of a development assessment, which uh, Getsy has followed. So some suggestions um, that we found uh, to be helpful for people, maybe keep some notes, uh, digital or paper, um, about aspects of the module of the webinar that you are most interested, um, that interest you most, and steps you would need to integrate it into your own teaching. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Bobby Karimi, um, one of the two authors of the Planning for Failure, um, Landslide Analysis for a Safer Society module. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, Beth, do I uh, want to share my screen or? Yes, let me stop sharing now. Thank you for that. And, um, and I'll just, while we're, while it's thinking about stopping, um, I think should it, I think you should be able to take it now. Yes. Uh... Then um, do feel free to um, put things in the chat box, everybody, um, as we go along and um, uh, Mitchell and I will moderate that and we'll, we'll jump in with a question that seems really relevant. Otherwise, we'll keep them to the end where we're, we'll have a section for question and answer. Go for it, there, Bobby. All right, um, thank you. So um, our module that uh, Stephen Hughes at the University of Puerto Rico, my grads, and I developed is uh, looking at landslide analysis for a safer society. And um, our overall, goals for this module were to have students process, analyze, and interpret geodetic data to identify and classify mass wasting sites and connect them, uh, sorry, connect their development to environmental factors as one major goal. A second goal that we have is to bring this aspect of quantitative analysis and modeling to landslide susceptibility and evaluate the relationship between mass wasting event sites and local geospatial factors. And our last goal is to synthesize susceptibility models looking at environmental, social, and political considerations as a guide to develop a comprehensive landslide risk assessment. And part of what I find particularly interesting about this module, having delivered it now twice, um, is that it, it identifies and works on skills that industry and um, students and professors have identified that uh, the overall graduating population of geology and geography students need a little bit more development in. Um, and I've highlighted the ones that I think we really target here. Um, so preparation of geological investigations, the last of the units in this module culminates in a risk assessment and hazard mitigation plan, which I see as like an analog for a geological uh, investigation and the preparation of it. There's a lot of adaptability, especially when we're dealing with technical aspects and computers. Uh, so students need to be able to troubleshoot and adapt given different conditions. Not every student has the same operating system. Not every student has the same level of skills when it comes to uh, computers. And combined with time management, adaptability and uh, time management really help that student overcome a lot of challenges. And this module really questions a lot of ethical practices, particularly in the last unit regarding um, how students approach hazard mitigation and risk assessment, what is an acceptable risk, what is not acceptable. Um, and then GIS and remote sensing skills are obviously being uh, developed in this module, as well as examining geologic processes in a lot more detail than they may have uh, in a standard classroom setting. So, 
in our module, we have four distinct units. Uh, unit one has students uh, looking at mass wasting events and identifying and quantifying aspects of them. So they're tasked to use Cloud Compare, which is freeware, and they can use Cloud Compare to look at LIDAR data from the USGS and um, LIDAR data from um, Puerto Rico, that was done in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria, and in a very specific region, looking at the total volumetric loss and volumetric gain um, due to mass wasting events. And so it requires them to step forward and um, overlap those data sets using common data points within the LiDAR data sets. And then it has them converting data, uh, migrating it over to ArcMap um, or QGIS, and then quantifying those volumetric aspects. Uh, unit two and three are combined really the um, landslide susceptibility modeling phase. And unit two more explicitly is the first phase where we examine the distribution of mass wasting events. And unit three uh, is the development and testing of models of landslide susceptibility, both uh, quantitative and qualitative testing. And then unit four is the um, analysis and prescription of a risk assessment and hazard mitigation plan following uh, FEMA guidelines and uh, USGS um, uh, data sets as well as data sets sourced from uh, local state governments. Uh, but for this uh, presentation today, I'm really only going to focus on units two and three. And that's not to say unit one and four are not interesting or important. It's just that unit two and three, I think, gives the full culmination of the different social aspects that we want to address. And in approaching unit two, when we talk about distribution of events, I thought it would be wise and it has been fairly successful to start really further back and having students just analyze patterns and think about what a pattern is and how we identify these patterns as representations of mass wasting events in elevation data or other um, satellite or aerial remote sensing source data sets. So um, for my first question, if you don't mind in the chat box below or wherever it may be on your screen, uh, just looking at the pattern that's given here of these boxes, if you could guess what the sixth color uh, would be for the sixth box. I, for some reason, cannot see the chat box. Um, It may be floating around as a pop-up window since you're currently screen sharing. Oh, I think because my PowerPoint is expanded to the full screen, I'm not able to see what's behind it. Um, if you um, go up to the more on your um, controls, you should be able to hit the chat box. It'll pop, pop up as a separate window. Hmm. But I can tell you everybody said red. Okay, good. Uh, I think we'll have to go with that. Um, I'm still unable to see it on my end, but um, okay. So yes, the six box would be red. Um, so now let's complicate this a little bit further. Um, what would be the color or what, what is the expected pattern here? Um, so just take a look at the pattern and rather than kind of answering what the next shape or the next color would be, um, just take a moment to think about what difficulties you're having in identifying the pattern. And if you don't mind putting that in the chat box, um, and then after a few seconds, I'll let you know what the sixth uh, shape slash color would be. So no color repetition. They're saying maybe a dark red square. Somebody's a square that's light red. Um, non-repeating pattern. Okay, yeah, so this, is, this is good. Yeah. Um, this is usually more than what students are able to guess. So um, the pattern here is that it's alternating from cool colors to warm colors with disregard to the exact shape. Um, and so what makes this a little bit more difficult to identify is because we've now included an extra variable and we've given a range of variables that are acceptable as the answer, whereas before it was just red or blue, now all ranges of warm colors are acceptable and all ranges of cool colors are acceptable. 
And then, so in this pattern, we've got the alphabet, but we've got letters missing. So what letters are missing and why? And if you'd like to type that into the chat box. So letters missing C, O, P, S, uh, S. So people are getting the missing letters, or the P is there, I guess. Um, but nobody has forwarded a Y. Well, this one's a little bit trickier, and um, it's just that in this font, those are the only three letters that are constructed entirely of curved components, and there is no straight component in those letters. And so this becomes a little bit harder for us to uh, understand as a pattern and perhaps for students to pick up as a pattern, because it really depends on the perspective you look at it. When you look at it just from the perspective of letters, that's you get one set of results, you understand what's missing, but you have to look at it from the perspective of the font and how letters are constructed by shapes. And that increases the difficulty of detecting said pattern. So what patterns are, I have students uh, meet in small groups and come up with a definition and usually after a couple minutes they're able to come up that it's some sort of discernible regularity. Right? Um, and the pattern uh, in a natural system can be highly variable. And at the very least, we hope that students understand that there are at least three dimensions required to describe natural patterns. And in a um, geospatial system, those three are your latitude, your longitude, and your elevation, or your spatial coordinates. And patterns can be scalable. The patterns that we look for on a large tectonic scale are, are very different in size compared to the patterns that we look for perhaps in nutrient cycling within a small region. So we have to think about these patterns as multiple, uh, within multiple scales and scopes. And so why do we care about patterns? It's helpful for us to predict, and that's really what I want the students to understand. And I even argue that with them that the crux of all science is pattern recognition, detection, and prediction. By being able to predict, we can save lives, we can prevent damages, and we can overall improve the quality of lives. So who sees patterns? And this is a tricky one. Um, pattern recognition is not something we cognitively fully understand yet. So who sees patterns? Is any animal or human being um, that can assign a survival value to that pattern recognition detection and prediction task. So at this point, it's fun to bring up this image. This is um, topographic liniments in excess of one kilometer in length that my students identified in uh, for the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, there are over 120,000 of them, I believe, um, on this image. And um, for the first poll that we have, uh, that will come up on your screen in a second here, my question is, is there a discernible pattern in this image? Okay, I think we'll end the poll there. Um, yeah, so, so <laughs> it looks overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, on. it's uh, overwhelmingly everybody said yes, there is a discernible pattern. And I believe at this point, most people are likely noting um, the Valley and Ridge province that is within the southeastern quadrant of the state. Now, if we go to look at just a specific region, in the highlighted region, can you discern a pattern here? And we'll put up another poll for this one.
Okay, I think we'll cap it there. Right. So a little bit more variability here, but overall, um, it's a lot harder to see any discernible patterns. And for those of you who did see a pattern, I would love to pick your brains. Um, I myself have difficulty seeing a pattern in that. And the point of this for the students is for them to realize that there is a limit to pattern recognition that humans can do. That we are overburdened by a variability of data and the overall quantity of data as well. And so it's a benefit um, for students to recognize this because we can kind of lead them to the next logical step. Well, if we can't do it as humans, what can or who can? And inevitably the answer comes down to computers. So we have to think about computational modeling as just an extension of what humans are capable to do. So how we see patterns is a very interesting um, discussion to have with students. The mental or cognitive process is incredibly complex and very poorly understood to this date. Um, one of the broad definitions of pattern recognition cognitively uh, is the external signals arriving at the sense organs that are converted into meaningful perceptual experiences. You know, we, we, me and my students spend a lot of time talking about what is a meaningful um, perceptual experience. But it's important for students to understand that pattern recognition as a cognitive process is not fully well understood, meaning that the extension of pattern recognition that, that's done by humans into the computational realm, therefore still has a lot of limitations. So the concept of an ideal or a pattern, we discuss whether it's deductive and innate to the observer or inductive, one that we learn through observation of imperfect examples typically done in a learning system with a teacher. And inevitably we come to the conclusion that it's most likely inductive though we don't disregard the fact that there could be biological processes that um, force things to be deductive in certain instances. Um, and those can be argued back and forth for a while. Uh, we stop being able to see patterns as we've discovered through the prior uh, exercises when we are overburdened with variables right? or uh, the accuracy becomes uh, questionable, the scale, the efficiency, or if we introduce bias. And computers can overcome a lot of these limitations, but the human bias is still an important um, player here because we can only mimic what we are aware of. So we're really building this connection between cognitive processes and computational models and algorithm development. And hopefully this gets students to reinforce higher order uh, computer literacy skills by thinking and making these types of connections. So how does a computer see patterns? And this is a very difficult question to an, uh, answer, but for the most part, it needs to learn much the same way we do if it's going to mimic us ideally. And that's by looking at artificial intelligence and machine learning. But the pattern analysis of natural phenomena requires appropriate mathematical recognition and detection methods. We have to have the language that computers speak, and we have to have the words in that language or the equations to be able to perform the task. The proper implementation of these methods in hardware and software platforms is integral to doing pattern analysis for natural phenomena. And so that means we need to have workflows to facilitate pattern analysis. And we as researchers have to be well versed with the data types and characteristics and have the required knowledge on the general workings of these required methods. And this is at a time that me and my students typically find ourselves recognizing hopefully that a lot of, oops, sorry, that a lot of students really think point number three is the purpose of the classroom experience and they sometimes forego that point number two and point number one are equally important in understanding any learned material and any sort of pattern recognition analysis and prediction. So can we predict an exact location in which something may occur and this brings up a really great uh, conversation with students about why it's possible, why it's not possible, and really getting them to think about susceptibility. 
So when we talk about landslide or mass movement susceptibility or earthquake or flooding susceptibility, what are we talking about? Is it the likelihood of occurrence or is it an exact time where something will occur? And we understand susceptibility to be a likelihood of occurrence compared to relatively other or similar regions. Um, and geoscientists often use susceptibility as a form of prediction. And so this is a great lead in into talking about what is the mathematical tools that we have to do landslide susceptibility or pattern prediction. And what we use in unit two and three is the frequency ratio method, which is a bivariate method um, that's very, very popular uh, because it's very friendly to end users. It's very simple to run. And the vulnerabilities to slope failures of individual factors can be investigated. So we can compare the presence of landslides to the distrib spatial distribution of um, slope angles or to the spatial distribution of precipitation. So here we talk about um, frequency ratio values between landslides and another factor as the landslide susceptibility index. And oftentimes researchers use the whole area of the landslide, but sometimes this isn't suitable. And this is a great moment to talk to students about scale, right? That if your pixel size for some of your data sets is let's say one kilometer, does it matter if you've got um, a small 30 square meter uh, landslide in that, or should you just use a data point? And so we talk about scalability and what is um, helpful to use. Now in this unit two, we use data points representing the uh, topmost elevation in the headscarp region of each landslide polygon rather than the full landslide polygon, only because it's a little easier for students to wrap their heads around and the overall scale we're looking at, the size of Puerto Rico and about a quarter the size of the state of Arizona, uh, are very large in scale, meaning that a lot of the areas become drowned out when we're looking at the relative pixel size of our data. So when I discuss the math required to do this, uh, to do the frequency ratio method with students, I typically step back and start from a more qualitative approach leading into the equation rather than giving the equation first. I find that students when given the equation out the gate tend to get a little overwhelmed and panic and that limits their ability to understand the um, math. So I start by telling them it's just the natural log of the frequency of landslides in a factor area or a, a subclass within a factor divided by the frequency of landslides in the total area. And then we take that forward and just break that down. What is the frequency of landslides in an area? Well, it's the number of landslides in that factor class, F sub i, divided by the area of that class over the total number of landslides in the region divided by the total area of that region. And that we mathematically denote this using these symbols. Students have uh, mentioned to me that this is a little bit easier for them to digest than going in the reverse. And um, I'm only going off of my own personal anecdotes on how successful this is. But once these calculations are done for a factor class and for the overall area, we want to interpret what those LSI values that result mean. Positive LSI values indicate that there is a factor, I'm hearing a lot of beeping. Um, I still can't bring up the chat window. Um, was there a question? I, I think that was my doorbell. Sorry about that. I'll oh, mute. No. <laughs> okay. Um, so a positive LSI value indicates that the factor favors the occurrence of landslides so that the more positive the value, the greater the correlation be, or between the spatial distribution of landslides and the factor itself or the factor class. Negative LSI values indicate the opposite, that it does not favor the occurrence of landslides and it is a worse correlation. So whenever we have a factor, we have to think about how do we divide that factor into classes. So let's take an example of elevation. Elevation is a quantitative, sorry, elevation is a quantitative data set. 
meaning we can use ArcMap's built-in classification tools to do this mathematically by looking at the histogram of the data and it's uh, the categories versus the frequencies. Right? So for the elevation data set, we can break it up into three, four, five, eight, nine different classes. It's up to the user and it can be classified based on using uh, natural breaks, manually entered in based on equal interval or any of the other options that are available in uh, ArcMap or QGIS. But there are data sets that are a little bit more quantitative and an example of this could be something like land cover or aspect, the orientation of a hill slope, right? And so defining north is a little bit harder to do mathematically because north could be everything from 315 degrees to 360 degrees and then again from 0 to 45 degrees. So I've had students use four categories, northeast, southwest, some of them have done Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, and Northwest, and some have gone and done eight categories or six and broken it up a little bit differently. And so here they have to go in and manually control how these classifications are created. And once we have these classifications done, we can start to process and calculate the LSI. Now, this is where I stop because I know a lot of times in my classes, students don't fully understand or have the strong computer literacy skills to understand that what they're trying to do with the computer that sounds so simple perhaps to them at this point is a lot more difficult for the computer to handle. So I show them this, I show them that equation and we talk about the needs that we have to be able to input values into this equation to get an LSI value. And then uh, the computer code that is created in ArcPy or ArcMap to uh, develop a tool to automatically do this for students, I usually bring up the sections of that like this and tell them that only the red portions are the actual parts of the code that addresses the calculation of LSI. All of this other stuff is happening prior or in the background and it's just added workload. And we have to think about these and we compare them to cognitive processes, like import system modules in ArcPy. Think about the problem. Input parameters. What parameters do you need and bring them in? Input a workspace. Where are you physically going to be saving your data and working? What data sets do you need? Bring them in, right? And these are things they don't have to explicitly do because the code does it for them. But um, a really good exercise in getting students to understand how difficult workflows and coding can be is to have them create a peanut butter jelly sandwich and give you a workflow for how to do that. And it's a lot of fun because it can get a little bit messy because somebody will say, uh, take the peanut butter and put it on the bread. And what I'll do is I'll take the peanut butter jar and I'll put it on a slice of bread. And then they'll be like, well, no, you have to open it first. Right? And then by going through an exercise like that, it reinforces this idea that the computer is doing far more than what, is, what it may be visibly showing you. All right, so at this point, um, it's a good place for students to start better understanding the data sets we're working with. We're looking at Puerto Rico and Arizona, and we're using the six factors that are listed on the right-hand side of this screen. Um, so just as a poll, a prediction, which of these factors do you think will have the greatest LSI values uh, for Puerto Rico? Alrighty. Um, so it seems like we've got almost a tie between slope and mean annual precipitation. Um, ironically, as it turns out, lithology is uh, very meaningful for Puerto Rico as well, but mean annual precip and slope are equally important as well. Uh, which LSI value will be the most positive will depend on how students treat the data, whether they split it up into five, six, or ten classifications. But 
uh, we, I always have students write down their prediction at the top of a page, and they're gonna come back to this at the very end when we go over discussions um, at the end of the lab uh, to see how well their prediction panned out. And I also have students do this for Arizona as well because those, that's the second data set that we have. And we also talk about the why they think it's going to have a favorite. Now the two data sets are for Arizona and Puerto Rico. And we have all of the uh, prepared factors, but they have not been classified. And then we have uh, the landslides for each region broken up into a 75 and a 25 category. That's 75% of the total landslides randomly selected and then the remaining 25%. The 75% is the training data set to create and generate the models. And then the 25% is the test data set they'll use in unit three to assess quantitatively um, the efficacy of each model. Now in Arizona, uh, the area within it only has 620 landslides, but the landslides for Puerto Rico, we're only using 2,053 of them, but in actuality, there is 41,053 landslides, but that would overburden a lot of people's computational resources. So we reduce the data set for the purposes of this module. So in unit two, students will ultimately give a, pres a presentation and discuss uh, different factor classes that they as an individual or in small groups were responsible for. Right? So students do an oral presentation that outlines their logical thought process to evaluate and select factors in their classes. And so I'm gonna give you an example of uh, my students work on just slope and mean annual precipitation from the first time I ran the GETS module. So they noted that the critical angle and gravity are the main mechanisms of slope failure. A lot of this was learned in unit one regarding what a landslide is and what are the physical, um, what is the physical behavior of them and the physical laws that govern why they move. Um, and they said that the steeper the slope, the more susceptible an area is likely to be to landslides. And so it will therefore result in a much higher LSI value. So they ran two separate trials using two different classification schemes. Uh, the first one they ran was with natural breaks and they had equal amounts of data per class with three classifications and they picked three classifications for simplicity's sake. And the max LSI that they got was 0 0.777 or 0 0.78 and um, it the overall, their hypothesis held true here that as we increase um, elevation, or sorry, slope, we increase susceptibility. For trial two, they did the same thing, but with seven classifications rather than um, three, and then they started noticing a weird pattern that the higher susceptibility ranges were in moderate uh, slope categories, um, from 14 to 27 degrees rather than in the highest uh, categories. So as a poll, um, between slope trial one and slope trial two, which one would you more likely lean to as using as part of a model? Okay, I think we'll end it there. All right, so most people said um, trial two, and uh, my students agreed. Um, the reason they picked trial two was because it had both the biggest range of LSI values and because it had the greatest maximum. And they felt that there, it was a better representation of what was naturally occurring, whereas with uh, less classifications, they felt like it was lumping up too much data where there may have been overlap between low and high LSI values. Uh, for precip, they predicted a positive LSI values for areas with an increased amount of mean annual precip and negative for areas with lower. 
And as this turns out, um, it was a little bit different that the higher the precip, the lower, um, we got some pretty low values of LSI, but moderate ranges of precip were a little bit more effective. Um, this was given a natural breaks classification of nine classes. And then they did the same thing uh, using a manual method with four classes and they saw the same sort of trend that the moderate ranges of rainfall uh, were associated more with the presence of landslides. Uh, sorry, and I see here somebody asking, isn't rate of precip almost as important as mean annual precipitation? Uh, yes, absolutely. And we do discuss that at the end discussion with students when we go over each, um, each different factor and why it was used and why it may not fully represent uh, what they're looking for. So between these two trials, uh, let's see what you all think is the best one to move forward with. Alrighty. Um, so most people went with trial one and um, my students also agreed with that for um, much of the same reasons as before. Largest range, greatest maximum, uh, uh, smallest minimum, um, showed the most variability that could be applicable. Now, um, at the end of the unit discussion, I talked to students and these are just some samples for this unit to think about their home area, where they're from and what factors they think will have the highest LSI values. Um, I have them think about um, additional factors beyond the six we tested and a lot of students uh, throw out soils or um, they look at vegetation types or they want to look at uh, peak ground acceleration or shakeability. And so this unit introduces the initial part of the predictive modeling that we continue in unit three. And I ask them, you know, how simple do you think predictive modeling is now? And these are related to uh, some uh, pre-questions that I ask them leading up to unit two. So what other things could we apply the frequency ratio method to other than landslides? Let's see what people suggest. So I'm seeing some people type in floods, earthquakes, wildfires, tornadoes. Um, yeah, and it's applicable to a lot of different methods and or to a lot of different data sets. As a term project, one of my students looked at, for instance, um, what was it? Not hotspots, but um, hot springs. The location of hot springs and tried to see if he could predict if there were additional locations worth uh, establishing a hot spring uh, that's a hot spring spa. <laughs> All right, so in unit three, we take it a bit further because now we're starting to think about modeling more explicitly rather than just comparing factors to the presence of landslides. So I have students go through and better understand what I mean when I say the word soci uh, sociopolitical landscape and we break it down into the three categories. Um, and it's important here because not a lot of them fully understand what a sociopolitical landscape is referring to. And then we have them think about the sociopolitical landscape of your own country, your region, and why the sociopolitical landscape is the way it is. Um, for my region, coming from northeastern Pennsylvania, we've got a lot of anti-science going on in the background here. We've got a lot of uh, questioning of government. And this isn't to say it's right or wrong, but it kind of helps define how policy can be developed and how society can be benefited by these policies in a given context of a sociopolitical landscape. We also have them look at uh, describing the national sociopolitical landscape as it pertains to science, kind of getting at some of these little, um, not little, but very big topics in mainstream media, especially that are very anti-science. Okay. 
And we asked them, what is the intended use of a model? Is it to uh, predict and sure, but who does it go to? Does it go to politicians? Is the intended use for the everyday person? Um, we talk about model limitations and why those limitations might exist. So I further asked them what role models personally play for them and weather is the big one that comes up all the time and students say, well, I don't trust so-and-so naming some sort of weather person on, um, uh, I guess, a news source. Um, and then some say, well, I do because of this. And then so we get to have some really great conversations here. Um, we talk about what roles models play in society and why people tend to trust models or not and why they might disregard them and what role models play in overall politics. And um, we think about what aspects of the modeling process make it vulnerable uh, when the results challenge society, policy, or economic status quo. Um, and we question if there's anything we as scientists could do to um, help people better understand the value of models. And I find this a really helpful discussion to have with students because it really establishes for them um, value in generating a much better model uh, for unit three. And we use um, a receiver operating characteristic curve to evaluate their models, which is just a combination of different LSI maps that they generated in unit two. And they decide what uh, factors go into it, what factors don't. I have them generate at least two different models to compare. Um, in some cases, if the groups are large, I had them do five different models. And when they plot the true positive rates versus false positive rates and look at the area under the curve, the area under the curve is the value that's really important here. And values less than 0.5 aren't really possible, but values that are very close to 0.5 mean the model is not a good predictor but those closer to one means the model is an excellent predictor. So as a poll here, looking at the image on the right, uh, which is the final susceptibility model, uh, which we'll talk about qualitatively in a bit here, but quantitatively, does anyone have a good prediction of what they think uh, its overall accuracy will result in or its area under the curve? Can we get this poll up or is it, oh, there we go. Yeah, so I'm just asking just for the uh, susceptibility model that was generated on the right with uh, red regions being very high susceptibility and dark green being low susceptibility, yellow in the middle, um, what the predicted area under the curve would be for us looking at it. All right. So it looks like most people said somewhere in the 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 range, and that's actually really, really close. Um, the area under the curve was 0 0.706. Um, so quantitatively, just looking at this with it kind of being in the mid range, let's take a poll here to see if you would or would not uh, use this model as a predictor. All right, um, this is coming out a lot like election results, really, really close. But yes, this is a, a, almost like a 50-50 here. Um, and the students really have an interesting time answering this as well, thinking about, is it a good predictor or is it not? And this lays the foundation for saying, well, let's assess it another way beyond just quantitative. And one way we could do that is through a qualitative analysis. Hey, um Bobby, yep. there's, I think there's a couple questions there sort of indicating that people might not be 100% sure what this area under the curve is. Do you think you might oh. be able to back up and just help them with sure. that? Yeah, so the area under the curve here, um, 
for each cutoff between very high, high um, susceptibility or low, moderate susceptibilities, for each cutoff in this final image that defines each of these colors, we look at how many landslides fall above the cutoff versus how many total landslides there are. And that's the true positive rate using the 25% data set um, that we had left over from the landslides uh, that was in the data set itself. And then we look at the number of pixels that are identified as a false positive uh, compared to the true positives as the false positive rate. And when we plot those, we get a nice little curve like this one, hopefully. And if we fit a polynomial equation to it and integrate from zero to one to calculate its area under the curve, we get a prediction of how um, accurate our model is. The closer our value is to one, the most accurate it is, whereas the closer it is to 0.5, the least accurate it is. Hopefully that helped. Uh, and then we get to a qualitative analysis here. And um, I'm going to skip the poll on this one, uh, but qualitatively, the students um, do tend to pick up on there's regions where, let's say right here, I'm not sure if everyone can see my mouse, but there's red regions juxtaposed to moderate regions. And there is no gradient going from very high susceptibility to um, high susceptibility then to moderate. And then you have a section um, up in, let's say down here that has very high juxtaposed with very little um, gradient between right next to very low susceptibility. And the patternation doesn't necessarily look particularly natural to what we uh, understand about their surface. There is a lot of gridded boxy cutoffs and those don't seem right. So these are all part of this qualitative analysis to say that while the area under the curve may be sort of in that moderate range, the qualitative analysis of this is telling us it's not necessarily an accurate um, model. So these are two models, uh, trial one and trial two, that were created by my students for Puerto Rico. Um, and these were the area under the curves they figured for each model. And these are the individual factors that they considered for that model. And it's a, just an average of each factor's LSIs. Um, so in the chat box, would you pick trial one or trial two as the better model? So we're getting a decent mix of trial two and one. They're both very similar. Um, but if we go on and look at the difference between trial one and trial five, right, they look a, a lot more different. And their areas under the curve are still kind of within that same range of it's moderately okay. But we get an opportunity to talk about scale. Um, if and, and the purpose that somebody needs this model for. If the purpose is to decide where to live and where to construct a home, the high resolution model, which is trial one here, would probably be more ideal. But if we're really interested in just kind of generally understanding where landslides are more susceptible, trial number five may be adequate for our purposes. And the students in unit three are tasked with doing a poster presentation of their uh, overall methods and discussion and results regarding the final susceptibility modeling. So at the end of this unit, uh, we discuss uh, what roles that their models could play for individuals in both society and politics, um, why someone could disregard your group's final selected model, thinking about how to communicate a proper defense. And asking students how their opinion of modeling, its results and its uses in guiding uh, policy change has changed, and if they find themselves more or less critical of modeling than they did perhaps before. And we end by asking students how simple they think predictive modeling is now compared to the response from unit two. So other challenges I faced is students, um, <laughs> 
have troubles with computers. Not all computers are the same. Not all networks are the same. So depending on where they are and what lab, if it's a home computer or not, there are different challenges. Um, and I've always given students this rule of um, you must try three different troubleshooting techniques before coming to me or the TA. Um, and the purpose of this is not to make them struggle, but it's to help them develop troubleshooting skills in that process. And so when a student comes to me and says, well, I don't know what's going on here, that's different than when a student having tried three things can come to me and say, I don't know what's going on and I've tried this, this, and this. That helps narrow down what could be the problem on my end so I'm not spending as much time with individual students and instead can um, mitigate each uh, instance of um, a problem in a shorter amount of time. A um, lot of students to this day, and I still don't understand this one, think that saving in ArcMap is not necessary, that it just does it for you. Um, control S, I see somebody put that in there, is just second nature. My hand is, if not on Control C or V, it's on Control S all the time. And I, every so often, just without thinking about it now, I'm hitting Control S and saving. And if you have one faculty member and many, many students, troubleshooting becomes a nightmare. And this is why that um, trying three things before you talk to the faculty member really saves a lot of time and brings the burden from uh, of troubleshooting off of the instructor and puts it more so on the individuals. So if you're going to offer this type of a module online, um, you can use Zoom or similar software to allow screen sharing. And this makes troubleshooting very simple. I've been doing it with a lot of my students who are going through a lot of the Getsy units right now. Um, I know asynchronous lectures are what we prefer, but synchronous lectures uh, are helpful. And I have synchronous lectures that I'd say at least 70% of my students attend. And then I upload the recording of that lecture at the end for those who couldn't make it. But in that synchronous lecture, you can troubleshoot a lot of problems about understanding when students get the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I would move a lot of the discussions to an online environment prior to a synchronous lab overview for the hands-on components. And this will help kind of facilitate those connections between society, politics, cognitive science, math, et cetera. Um, I encourage students to help one another. So I team them up in groups of four and those are their troubleshooting buddies. And if they can't figure it out, the four of them bring it to me. And if all else fails, you can use the pre-made data for each unit and focus more on analysis and interpretation rather than data processing. Oh, I guess, um, Beth, I will stop sharing and let you take over. Beth, you're muted if you meant to be unmuted. Okay, sorry, my apologies. I know we're nearly out of time, but I just wanted to give people um, uh, a visual on the Getsy webpage and mention that in addition to the majors level module, which you've heard so much about, there is an intro level surface process hazards module. The uh, majors level one um, has this type of a look to it. And for instance, if you went into unit three, you would see that there's, you know, detailed descriptions with a lot of the the different assignments and also the, the data sets and teaching tips and things like that. Um, I know we're pretty much out of time for questions, but I, if, and people should feel free to leave if they would like, but if um, anybody wants to ask some questions about teaching the module um, or some suggestions and comments, uh, we can hang in here for a few more minutes, um, the leaders, and feel free to pose those questions in the chat box. And I do encourage you to take your own notes about um, your impressions and things you might use. And maybe while people are thinking if they have any questions, I'll just go on to the final page here um, and say we would really super appreciate it if you'd fill out the webinar evaluation. Um, and to mention that next week on Wednesday, the next NAGT webinar um, will be suddenly teaching geoscience online um, with a panel of 
people um, who have experience with it. And a month from now, we'll be having another GETC module on flood hazard. So thank you so much. And if people do have lingering questions, we'll, uh, it looks like um, there's a couple, uh, we'll stay on and, and try to answer them. So Bobby, sure. yeah, people are having to run. Let's see, what type of independent research projects can students do after learning these modules? Um, so it's actually really interesting. Um, I've had students, like I said, look at hot spring distribution. I've looked at students look at AMD runoff. Um, they've tried to use the bivariate method or the frequency ratio method to look at the spatial distribution of a lot of different types of data. Um, so I think that really helps for them putting it together and it helps them in kind of thinking about prediction. We've had a couple biology students use this to look at um, the density of tree species in a region versus different uh, environmental factors as uh, that were classified and processed using the frequency ratio method as well. So there's a lot of different uh, ways that they can approach this, but I think more importantly beyond the math, it's the computational skills of having more familiarity, having worked more in depth with ArcMap and Cloud Compare and seen multiple different software, and they use Excel in this as well, so it just helps them familiarize and use those as tools to solving um, scientific and engineering related problems. Question, what's your opinion about weight of evidence? Could I get a clarification on that one? I'm not sure what you mean by the weight of evidence. If you wanna unmute and ask verbally, that's fine. Uh, we're not hearing anything. Uh, bivariant method oh. to predict landslides? Um, I, I neither here nor there on it. I, I specifically don't do uh, waiting for this uh, particular approach, but you could. We've had students in the past attempt to weight their data so that the maximum or the maximum absolute LSI value in any factor for any factor was used to normalize everything from negative one to one. Um, and they got very different results that were perhaps not as accurate, um, though I'm sure that in certain cases it might be more accurate. Um, but for the purposes of this module, we use just this singular method and uh, push forward from there, but students are free to adapt it, the methodology if they can make some sort of sense of it uh, on their end. Okay, that looks like it. Thank you so much um, for everybody for your attendance and thank you so much, Bobby and Mitchell for helping to run the webinar.